Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. Thank you to our generous underwriters of Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Friday, April 14th, we are starting a new series here on Sharper Iron. It is called The Love of God. This series will take us through the three epistles written by St. John, the Apostle and Evangelist. We've spent the last several months reading through the gospel written by this same apostle, the one who consistently referred to himself simply as the disciple whom Jesus loved. St. John knew of no better way to think of himself than as one loved by Jesus. And he wants all the family of God to think of themselves in this same way. We are the people loved by God. In his epistles, we will hear St. John come back to that truth time and time again, all the while expounding upon the entirety of the Christian life, how that love of God that he has for us moves us to love each other. In today's episode, we will introduce John's first epistle and study the text, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us the Reverend Dr. Larry Rast. Dr. Rast serves as the president of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Rast, welcome to Sharp Iron. Thank you. It's great to be with you and with all the listeners. It is a pleasure to have you today, Dr. Rast. How are things going there at the seminary in Fort Wayne? We are truly blessed. We're at that point in the school year where, first off, the students are all exhausted. Uh, the faculty <laughs> are falling apart. But we're looking forward to call day, uh, which is just a couple of weeks off. And so everybody's getting focused. Everybody's getting fired up about uh, really what is the center of our life together as a community every year, and that is seeing men placed into calls so they can serve uh, the Lord and his church by preaching the gospel and administering his sacraments. And also we'll be placing deaconesses as well uh, who will be serving with works of mercy uh, and supporting the pastors of our congregation. So it's just a great, great, great time to be at Fort Wayne. God be praised, and it's an opportunity for all of us to keep the seminarians, the candidates in our prayers, those coming from both of our seminaries, who will serve in the church very soon. God be praised, Amen. and God be with those men and women who will serve. Dr. Rast, we get to study First John, the first four verses this morning. We've been reading the gospel according to St. John here on Sharper Iron since the beginning of the year, so I feel like I've I've been immersed in the way that John thinks and writes even first John sometimes is a bit of a, it's harder to read than Paul's epistles for me. So just give us some introduction, some first initial thoughts on this epistle as a whole. Uh, what, do, what do we do with John in the way that he writes? Cause it's a little different than what we're used to reading. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. You know, it's, uh, uh, there's an immediacy to the book. Uh, you mm -hmm. don't really have an introduction. It just plows right into it. And I suppose in that respect, it's not unlike the gospel itself, you know, the, the reference to the beginning. Uh, and uh, he makes that tie-in right away as, uh, as the book opens. But you don't have the usual kind of Pauline greetings and kind of setting the stage and getting everybody comfortable. So one of the big questions is, you know, was, was this a letter in the classic sense, or might it have been something like a sermon that he preached? Uh, could be, uh, could be uh, uh, any number of things, but the the simple fact of the matter is, it's a it's a different kind of writing, it's a different kind of approach, and uh, really, I, I like the way that it confronts the reader immediately, uh, and it does so in a way that invites them to think about themselves within the larger context of the church. There's a there's the discussion of we and us, and, and we're all part of this. We've seen these things. We've touched them. And you can hear kind of the specificity that John has there as he says that. But you also then have this, this invitation to um, see yourself as one of those who's, who's 
heard of the Lord Christ, who had seen the, the marvelous works that he's done through the words that are proclaimed. And then John uses the this relatively short letter uh, or sermon or however you might describe it as a means of encouraging believers uh, in their knowledge of the truth that they've heard but also in their love for one another. So as you said it in the intro, I think you captured it absolutely perfectly. You know, this is all about a God who loved us so much, who loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, And now he wants these folks to see themselves as part of that story as well. And obviously then he wants us to see ourselves as part of that story as well. We're the ones whom, for whom Christ has died. We are the ones for whom he lives. Uh, and as the ascended Lord who reigns on high, he is our Lord and master and oversees uh, all things in our lives so that they work together for good for those who love God. It's, a, it's really kind of a, it is a challenging piece. And it is, uh, uh, again, kind of short, direct, to the point, blunt, you might even say, uh, and that kind of direct approach, I actually kind of like it. Yes, I. the more that I, I read John, and this epistle in particular, the more that I do appreciate the way that he is blunt, he is direct, and he comes back around to topics time and time again. I've seen scholars think about the structure of this letter almost as a, a spiral of sorts, mm-hmm. that John will start with one topic and then continue into another topic, but he starts then to loop back around to topics that he's already talked about, and he clarifies, he amplifies, and it's that it's that more circular or spiral pattern that sometimes you have to pause and think, okay, I think he's, he's talked about this already. What has he already said, and how is he now amplifying that and clarifying that for me? Whereas you know, Paul tends to be a little more linear from one step to the next, John again, he, he goes around and comes back around over and over again. And that bluntness, that directness is helpful. I think it, it takes what is a really a short letter. I, I went ahead and read all of this out loud at one point directly, and it took me just over 10 minutes to read the whole epistle out loud. So it, it would fit, at least in our context today, right in that time for a sermon. This could be read just as a sermon, as you were suggesting as a, a possibility. But it that that sort of, you know, it, it's a short letter, but there's so, or sermon, but there's, there's so much there to absorb and to, it, he keeps coming back to these themes and amplifying them that there's so much here for us. Yeah. And they're big themes. I mean, they're, and they're really important themes. I like the imagery of the spiral. Uh, you know, Paul is, is so, uh, in some ways he, he writes in a very formal way. Uh, and, and so you have the, the greetings and then the body of the letter and then, kind of a summary of the whole thing and then concluding remarks. And it's it's all what you would expect from a, a very gifted person, inspired by the Spirit of God, of course. But here we see the Spirit inspiring a person to, to write a little bit differently and using his particular gifts to communicate the great truths of the gospel uh, and some pretty challenging uh, and, and deep concepts to folks. And to do that, you have to, you have to, spiral back around. Uh, I, you know, I think back in terms of curriculum development as we do it in the, the seminary, there's, there's a kind of linear character to pastoral formation. You know, you take these classes, then you take those, and you end up with these. But one of the things that we're very purposeful in doing is making sure that there's kind of a, in, in early classes an introduction to the concepts, and then later on you revisit those concepts and get into it a little bit deeper, and then even later on again you return to them once more and there's a little more depth to it. Well, you know, this is the pattern for us as the people of God. And I know it's true for you and it's true for me and it's true for everybody listening that every time I read the scriptures, a little bit more opens up for me. And things that now seem as plain as the nose on my face, you know, I've managed to miss them uh, over the course of my life. And so this is where uh, this kind of writing by John, I think, really helps us out by revisiting uh, and returning to these themes so that we uh, we think about them once more, think about them a little bit more in depth, and then think about how they apply in our lives as the people of God. In that way, I think John, he exemplifies one of the themes that shows up in this epistle and is also apparent within his gospel, the idea of abiding in Jesus or abiding in his word. That's a way that Jesus speaks very commonly in the gospel of John. 
and John's going to talk about remaining or abiding within this epistle, just the way that he does this and, and revisits these themes of love and life and fellowship, to name a few that we'll talk about today. I mean, the way that he just comes back around to them, that's a good example of what it means for us as Christians to abide in the word of Christ. As you said, this is a common experience for all of us as Christians, that every time we enter into the word of God, he opens our hearts to to hear something new or to catch a different glimpse of something that maybe we didn't catch before to to see how it applies to our lives in a, a different way than we had seen it before. And it's a, a marvelous thing when we abide in the word of God like that to see how the Holy Spirit is at work in that word to strengthen our faith in Christ and also then to grow our love for each other. So John's writing is a wonderful example of that. It helps us to put into practice what it means to abide in the word of Christ, to abide in our Lord Jesus. Thinking about John as an author, uh, Dr. Rest, you've, you've made mention of the gospel in the already in our conversation, and so have I. What are some of the, the themes that you see in John's gospel that he also will bring up here in this epistle? Well, yeah, it's a great question. And you hit, a, you hit some of the biggies already, of course. Uh, remaining in Christ, you know, uh, that's such a huge part of the gospel of John. And how do you do that? How does that happen? Well, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Uh, you remain in Christ by staying connected to him. And while we might not see that kind of specific imagery and that kind of analogy here in this particular uh, text, you see it applied in uh, certainly in the sense of, of remaining uh, connected to Christ. And by being connected to Christ, you remain connected to the Father. If you have the Son, you have the Father. Uh, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father, which of course tells you that there was a problem, at least with some people in the early church who were not seeing uh, or who were driving a big wedge between the Father and the Son. Uh, and that's a concern also, of course, in uh, uh, the gospel. So there are these repeated themes uh, that you see there as well. The profound love of God for his creation and specifically for sinful people who've fallen away is uh, so, so pronounced in this particular letter slash sermon. Uh, I remember back when I was a uh, college student at Concordia, Chicago, we actually had to memorize First John 4 uh, in Greek, and specifically the portion on love uh, and God being love and what that meant in terms of our life together. Uh, and it was a pretty miserable enterprise to have to memorize that. We thought this is just going to be impossible. Uh, we didn't know that we were going to have to memorize Isaiah 53 in Greek. That was coming down the path. So th this was the first run and I've never forgotten just how profoundly that affected me in, in reading these words, putting them into my mind, and then as they penetrated into my entire life, my entire being, my heart, and so forth, uh, thinking about just the profound love of God expressed in the face of Christ for us. And, uh, you know, again, that's a, that's a, gospel theme, a, a gospel of John theme that's very prominent, and it also shows up here in such a profound way, particularly now in the early church uh, as John's aging, uh, as they explore what it means to, to live together and to love one another and to proclaim that gospel to uh, their communities so more and more people can know about Jesus. It's you know, that's that's John. I wrote these things so that you could know them. There's a lot more I could have put into this, uh, as he says in the Gospel of John. But here as well, he's talking about the things we've seen. I've witnessed this. These are accounts so that you can be certain of who Jesus is. And in knowing Jesus, you know the Father. And in knowing Jesus and believing in him, you see God's perspective towards you and that perspective is one of absolute unconditional love well, and then that perspective of god towards us in christ that absolute unconditional love affects the way that we view each other so the love that god has for us and I, you would have memorized this in greek as well when you're reading it in chapter four that that love that we have for us then we love each other mm -hmm. because god has loved us first and, and that too shows up throughout this epistle. And even in the way as, as John writes to or preaches to those who are hearing or reading, I mean, that love that John has received from Christ first, 
then affects the way that he talks to those to whom he's he's speaking with this often we'll call them either the beloved or he'll call them little children these very familial terms and that that love that john has for these people also comes from the love that god has for him and you you refer to john probably being a, an older man here not sure exactly what order the various writings that we have from john were, were given it's hard to to always be certain of that but yep. it does seem john's writing this as an older man likely a maybe a seasoned pastor uh, talk about that, that love that John has for his people, especially as, as one who is intimately involved in the training of pastors. How, how does John show us what it means to be a pastor who is loved by God and then loves his people? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, wow. <laughs> how do we do this concisely? It, uh, I, I think <laughs> you're right. I mean, uh, that it, it really does give kind of a, 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 a view into John's pastoral character, and we know he's an apostle, and we know uh, the incredible things that uh, he had witnessed and experienced himself personally with the other apostles, uh, his incredible experience in terms of uh, the book of Revelation as well. His, his life is truly, truly remarkable, but perhaps what is most remarkable uh, is the way that we see him caring for sinful people. And, and he's very realistic throughout this book that uh, we're going to struggle. We know that. You know, and anybody who says they don't sin, they, they're deceiving themselves. And the truth is not in them. And we confess that ourselves, of course. But, but he, he raises that point and he lit, puts that mirror in front of his hearers so that they can see once more, as you put it so beautifully, this is this just reveals all the more of the love of God for them specifically. And, uh, and of course, he himself has experienced that love from, uh, from God very directly. So uh, the, the manner in which he is, he understands the people with whom he's dealing. He understands the personal struggles that they experience, the the challenges that they, they have in their life together, the difficulties that just come upon the church, uh, even amongst uh, committed and believing people, these are just realities that we're going to struggle with because we continue to be sinful people. But at the same time, he he trumps all of that consistently with the love of God in Christ. And look at the relationship of the Father and the Son, this, this inseparable relationship in which the 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 service of the son on behalf of sinful human beings is accepted by the father for the sake of these people uh, who are separated from him that they might be restored unto him uh, and that then changes everything in terms of our own relationships and we all have a lot of relationships and those relationships can be pretty challenging at times and and there's some folks that we like a lot and some folks that we like a bit and some folks we don't seem really to like at all and oftentimes those folks are right within the church and here uh john is saying there is no difference all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god of course that's a quote from paul but but he's capturing that sense and saying uh, because we all are together purely by gr the grace of god in christ that transforms how we how we live together so then what that then means in terms of pastoral formation, thinking pastorally, well, it start, you know, you've received this as a pastor from Christ, and that now transforms the manner in which you interact with your with the people that God entrusts to you. Uh I I often say to our our students, you know, the uh, the the folks that you work with, the folks that God gives to you, uh, if you're young and idealistic like I was, you'll come into the congregation and you think, well, you know, I, I'm kind of a strategic planning type, you know, so it'll take somewhere between four to six years for me to create the perfect congregation. And I'll teach them all the truths of the Bible and everything will be transformed. Uh, very idealistic. And, uh, and we had incredible blessings at the congregation I served in Madison, Tennessee. Wonderful, wonderful people and saw a lot of people's lives being transformed and as they're they're walking in the the paths of the lord it's just such a great joy as a pastor to observe that but then he did something the lord did something he kept bringing in new people some of whom had good familiarity with the scriptural context some who really didn't have much knowledge of christianity at all 
and all these people who were in all these different places coming together, uh, it took me a little while to realize, I'm a slow learner, it took me a little re- time to realize that this it was always going to be the case that I would be teaching and shaping and sharing. And in that context, learning and, and being shaped myself in a greater love, first of all, for what God had done for me in his great mercy, and then how I was enabled to share that with others. And to me, that's the heart of pastoral formation right there. You, I, I delivered to you what was first given to me. And that's what you see John doing right here. Yeah, yeah, and it, and he keeps coming back to that basic theme that this is God's love for us that shapes who we are, that makes us Christians. And then when we look at each other as the beloved of God, not only as, as pastors look at their people as those loved by God, but as together in our congregations, we would see each other as those who are loved by God. When that's the first way we view each other, way that makes a difference in the way then that we treat each other and the way that we we show that love to each other. What a what a marvelous epistle sermon that John gives us here. One one more thought by by way of introduction, and I think you, you might have touched on this very briefly. In, in some of my reading, the, sometimes this is, is considered a, a polemical piece of literature that John writes or, or preaches, that he's got some opponents in mind. As For as much as he does emphasize the love of God, he will also emphasize very the, the great importance and the connection to the love of God to true doctrine. Mm-hmm. And, and it seems that there are, are those that are in the midst of, of John's congregation that have gone out from John's congregation that have been preaching some false doctrine. In our text today, we're going to hear John talk very much about the physical nature of what he's seen and heard and touched. Are, are there, what are maybe some of those false doctrines that are, are in view that John has in mind for his time and that we might still see in the church today? Sure. That's a, that's a very good question as well. The, uh, there, there, there's a movement that's emerging right around this time, and it has an impact on the church. And that that movement is called Gnosticism, and it comes from the Greek word gnosko, it means to know. And the argument of the Gnostics was that they had a special knowledge that others didn't have. Well, if you read John, you hear him consistently talking about knowing God and being aware of who God is and how you know God is through Christ, etc. Uh, themes that are all very familiar to us. And then with his positive statements with respect to that knowledge of God, he also then is, at least implicitly and then more explicitly in some places, uh, saying there are those who have gone out from us who are denying the truth. And the the denial is that Christ and the Father are one. Uh, It's a denial of the, the divinity of Jesus. It's a denial of the Trinity. So these are basic, basic kinds of problems and they're happening within the church itself. And and I think that's, I mean, in one sense, it's a little distressing uh, that even in the early church and even under the leadership of an apostle like John, uh, that there's confusion, distraction, disagreement within the church theologically. Uh, you know, how can this be? This is supposed to be the golden age. Well, all you have to do is back up a little bit to, to the life of Jesus himself. And here is the word incarnate, the creator uh, who is uh, speaking to people. I am he. And as he speaks that, people reject him as the, you know, the God man who is revealing the love of God to them in person. Uh, so that was the case for Jesus. Probably, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that that would also manifest itself with uh, uh, an apostle like John and a pastor like John. And we're going to continue to see that as part of the church's experience, even down to the present uh, and until our Lord graciously returns, that that will be our challenge. And so we're called to, and your point about keeping the doctrine clear is, is spot on. You know, here John is talking about life together. He's emphasizing the love of the people of God as they live their lives as God's children with one another. And at the same time, recognizing that there are points going to be tensions, there are going to be departures, there are going to be things that are very, very heartrending and disruptive to the life of the church. So what do we do as we're struggling within these contexts? We continue to confess Christ and him alone. And as we struggle in these things, we look 
to him alone because in Christ we see the love of God once more revealed in the clearest possible way as he gives as he lives the perfect life in our place as he gives his life as a ransom for many and then as he rises again on the third day and ascends to the right hand of God uh, so it's it's a great way of saying this is what the church always has gone through it's what the church is going through and it's what the church will go through until the lord returns that's why we call it the church militant yeah that's right so we continue to hold to the true word of christ in which we hear of his great love god's unconditional love for us sinners that brings us to love him and to love each other that is what we're going to hear from John in this epistle, and we are going to look at the first four verses of this book on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We are talking to Dr. Larry Rass this morning. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. to four with Dr. Larry Rast. He is the president of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dr. Rast, prior to the break, we introduced the entire epistle or sermon that John gives us here, the book of 1 John. I'm going to go ahead and read the text for our study this morning. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. That is our text for today. That is 1 John 1, verses 1 to 4. Dr. Rast, you mentioned already in our conversation a connection to John's gospel, the prologue in particular, and we have it right there in the way that this letter opens. He writes that which was from the beginning, and John's gospel starts in the beginning was the word. So talk about that connection, and what? why does John bring that up here from the beginning? Well, I think the first thing that he's doing is is keeping us connected to Christ and keeping the focus on uh, our focus on Jesus as the center of everything. Uh, but of course, at assuming that this is written quite a bit after the, the death and resurrection of Christ, one of the big questions that the early church folks are going to have to grapple with is, what if we never saw him? What if we were the ones who, who didn't have the the opportunity to uh, to view him directly, but we're dependent and are dependent on the words of others. And and, and so, I, again, what I see John doing, at least in part here, uh, is really working his hearers into the story of Jesus so that what is recorded in the Gospel of John uh, about Jesus and is really founded and has all of its focus in him now becomes their own focus. So what John and the other disciples experienced, and as he's recorded it under the inspiration of the Spirit in the gospel, 
they kind of see it for themselves. They are experiencing it uh, on their own uh, and for themselves as followers of Jesus. And the point, once more again, that he's trying to underscore, doctrinally speaking, by means of this, is that Christ is eternal. He is God. He was there in the beginning. Uh, and uh, you can't miss it, uh, certainly in the Gospel of John. So he kind of subsumes the entire Gospel of John into the epistle here, the letter, the sermon, however we want to describe it, kind of brings that entire gospel into this piece with the use of that one word, in the beginning. We This is the central thing, and that is the eternal Jesus, who is the one who's given his life and who has risen again for all human sin. Okay, so that which was from the beginning, John, with that phrase, subsumes his entire gospel, says, remember all of these things. That's what I want you to stay connected to. That is what I want you to experience. Even if you've never seen it yourself, if you never saw Jesus face to face as John did, here, this is for you. This is your story, that which was from the beginning, this Jesus, who is the eternal word of God, who has come in the flesh. That is what I am proclaiming to you. So that which was from the beginning, and we will hear John use that language of from the beginning in other places in this sermon epistle. That which was from the beginning. Now, John, he gets very physical with his language. He says, we've heard it. We've seen it with our eyes. We've looked upon it. We've touched it with our hands. Talk about this this physical witness that John is describing. Yeah, and again, it's to... to really correct uh, some other challenges that are manifesting themselves in the church. There's some folks who are are saying, uh, you know, Jesus only appeared to be a man. Uh, there are other folks who are saying Jesus only appeared or claimed, made a claim to be God. There are there are ways that people are are compromising the basic challenging truth that Jesus is simultaneously fully God and fully man. Uh, and so he, John here is trying to make the point, I think one one of the points that he's trying to make here is that he was fully and truly God from the beginning, but he was also fully and truly a man that we could see, hear, touch. You know, we, we knew who he was. We, we could recognize his voice. Uh, and so there's that strong, strong kind of apologetic character to what he's saying here making the the point to his ears that this stuff really is true. And we, not just me, I don't think it's the royal we here. Uh, I think it's him saying that there were witnesses to this. We have seen it. We testify to it. We speak to it. We're willing to put our lives on the line for this to say that Jesus is truly God and truly man. And that is a that is a brave thing to do. That is a uh, courageous thing to do in the midst of uh, circumstances as the Christian church is becoming increasingly marginalized and and will be overtly persecuted within uh, within just a few years. So, the, yeah, the, I think you're right. The we here is not just a royal we, but it, it is possible, I suppose, within that very congregation that he's preaching to or the people to whom he's writing that there would have been other people who who may have seen Jesus. We know from from Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus appeared after his resurrection to over 500. So some of those may still be living and, and can add their very living testimony to John's. And, and certainly even if he speaks of the we as the other apostles, even if those have already been martyred at this point, still their witness speaks. You know, we're coming up here on the a second Sunday of Easter in a couple of days, and we'll, we get to hear where Jesus provides for yet another witness to his resurrection. He allows St. Thomas to to see and to touch. And you know, I know I know that we we often speak of him as doubting Thomas, and and of course all the apostles they didn't believe till they saw either. But man, thanks be to God that He gave us these witnesses that these people really did touch and see and hear Jesus, so that they could write this down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so that we who have not seen can be blessed through faith. I mean, you know, this is a this is a blessed thing that John tells us here that that there is this real eyewitness testimony that we have and we can trust and it's written down for us in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. And I you know, I use the technical word of being an apologist, the one who is defending the faith. They are speaking up 
for what they know to be true, what they have seen with their eyes, and giving, if you will, legal testimony to its truthfulness and doing it for the whole world to hear and the whole world to see. Uh, and it's done out of not just a, a, you know, a defensive kind of posture. Obviously, that's there. We, you know, if you're called a liar, you know, you want to prove that what you're saying is true. But it's not just that. In fact, it's not first of all that. Instead, the testimony here, the witness that they are giving is to the truth of who Christ truly is. And, of course, that implies then what he has done for everyone by virtue of his life, suffering, death, and resurrection. Uh, and that, uh, again, is is kind of part and parcel of being the people of God in the church uh, because now, as those who've been brought into the church and whose story has been transformed by virtue of the story of Christ, we can make that witness as well and just as strongly as the apostles did. Oh, well, you didn't touch him. Yeah, but we have this unfailing witness given to us by the Holy Spirit through his chosen authors, and what these men say is true. And so let me tell you about it. I mean, that's where it drives us. That's where it pushes us in uh, sharing our faith and, and pointing others to Jesus. Well, and it's the the very physical nature that John describes here of seeing with our eyes and especially the touching with our hands. Later in this epistle, this sermon, John will talk about that that those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that is the spirit of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. This, you know, this coming in the flesh, Jesus still comes to us in fleshly ways, in ways that we can see and touch and and here, I mean, you hear the, the water that's poured into the baptismal font and you feel it upon your head and you taste the bread and the wine through which the Lord gives you his own body and his blood. You know, we still do receive this very physical witness from our Lord that, as you said, then we are we can share with others and point them. Look, here is where the Lord himself comes for you. The one who was from the beginning, true God and true man, he's here for you we we share in that witness and still in the way that the lord comes to us now it, there are very physical ways in which he does that yeah that's great so let's spiral on that point because you just captured it beautifully i think the uh, you know when i was a pastor in i we were on the north side of nashville great congregation as i mentioned um i interacted with a lot of folks uh from a variety of christian traditions as you might imagine and uh it was uh, Nashville was a pretty churched place at that point in time, so I could kind of presume the folks that I was interacting with, if they weren't going to a church, they still had some kind of experience in the church, and and that held pretty well. I don't know if it would anymore, and things are different thirty years down the pike. But one of the questions that constantly came up to me as a pastor was, uh, folks would say. Pastor, I just wish Jesus would speak to me. You know, I, I want to hear his voice. And I think they got tired of hearing me say it. He speaks to you every every week through his word. This is the living voice of Jesus. It's not a dead letter on a page. This is the living voice of Jesus through which he is impacting your ears and through your ears your mind and through your mind and your ears your heart these words jesus is he, through them he's transforming your life uh not only bringing you into this story but literally blessing you with the forgiveness of sins life and salvation so that you can have life and life to the full that's a powerful thing. And then he doesn't just stop with the word that we hear. And we can say, we've heard that voice of Jesus. He then gives us, uh, with simple water, connected with the word, regeneration, life again, kind of a John chapter 3 the theme there, uh, Gospel of John chapter 3 theme. Uh, and through holy baptism, welcomes us into his kingdom. Uh, and I like how you put it with the, you know, make the, the water splashing. Folks hear this kind of thing. Uh, a couple of weeks ago with a class in Fort Wayne, I had my students read the 1735 Constitution of Wilhelm Christoph Birkenmeyer, a pastor in the Hudson River Valley. And what could be more exciting than reading a church constitution <laughs> from 1735? Uh, but, but one of the things he did in this constitution was to say, when you baptize, 
fill up your hand and splash the water all around. Very physical, very, very clear that this is a washing of regeneration, that this is a place where God is pouring out the forgiveness of sins for his people and welcoming, welcoming them into his community. And, and like you said, also with the body and blood in the, in the Lord's Supper, all of this is, it just puts us right into the story. We're part of this narrative. It's ours. Yeah. Well, and so this is this is what John I think is is up to here. As he he continues, he says, "This is what we've we've seen, we've touched, we've heard, and it's concerning the word of life." Which the that that phrase, the word of life, and of course John uses that term word very prominently in his first chapter in his gospel. But that word of life it sounds rather abstract, perhaps. But John says this word of life that was made manifest. So, so it's been shown, you can see it. And of course, this is all setting up themes that he's going to dig into when he talks about what it means that we've seen God's love, but that we can, we can see it. So in the, in the word, in the sacraments, this is God making his, his life, his word manifest to us, to us so that we can see it. I, I love that from that, that church constitution of splashing the water <laughs> around. I know when I, when I baptize someone, there usually is water that, that kind of it falls onto the edges of the font and onto the floor. And, and, and the people at church are like, well, pastor, should we wipe it up? It's like, well, yeah, I don't want someone to slip. But on the other hand, no, I, I kind of want people to see that water there so that when they come up for the Lord's supper, they re- are reminded of their baptism yeah. in that very physical way. I mean, yeah, what a, that's great. what a wonderful thing. So yeah, this life was made manifest. We've seen it. We testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. I, Dr. Rast, there's just so much there. <laughs> talk. You pick a point and talk about it from those oh, verses. Oh boy, yeah. It, it, uh, <laughs> we've already made the point in the introduction that you had this kind of kind of urgency in the the text where you just start out with, yeah. uh, you know, this description of Jesus. And John is so excited, it seems to me, that he he bursts into this and then continues to unpack it little by little. Uh, and here he hits, I think, uh, perhaps one of the most transformative aspects of, of what he writes, and that is the life that is made manifest through Christ. And we have seen this life and we testify to it and we proclaim to you that it is eternal in character. So it's not just typical, regular human life. This is this is life changing, literally, that then extends into all uh, all eternity. So we're not just talking about something incidental. We're not just talking about something that is passing in character. Oh, you're born, you live, you die. No, every life is valuable. Uh, and what has made our lives particularly valuable now is the fact that Jesus gave his life for us and he has risen again to life for us so that life eternal is ours even now. Uh, it's not a thing off far off in the future in one sense. Yeah, but, but really life eternal is God's gift to us through Christ even now. And again, this is one of these transformative themes that changes the way we think and the way we act and the way we perceive others. Because this life now that we enjoy together in Christ is one that will continue for eternity. And for me to try and grasp that, you know, I'm a historian. I work with time, uh, you know, and, and here that those boundaries of time just are exploded and the eterna- eternality of God takes over, and it is awesome. Mm. Yeah, it really is. It is a very profound thing that that John can testify, and so can we as Christians, to the reality of, of eternal life that actually comes from the Father. I mean, I suppose on the one hand, read the first couple of verses here, and, and John says, well, we've heard this, we've seen it with our eyes. Well, but what's so impressive about all of this, John? Why, why does it matter that you saw this and heard this? And then he tells you why. It's because what he has seen and heard and touched is actually eternal life that comes from the Father himself. I mean, that is that is just remarkable. You brought up John chapter 3, that this is the, the new birth that comes not from the earth, but it comes from above. And that's what John is testifying to. That's what he wants us to have. And that's what Man, that's what we get to share 
with this world that that certainly needs it what a what a remarkable thing to to point people to other to point people to jesus and say this is eternal life for you it comes from you, you see all these other things around you and and those things they won't last but here we we've seen and heard and touched something that actually gives eternal life from the father himself that's a that's a profound thing to tell someone and that i mean Wow, what a, what a message that we have yeah, to share! Yeah, yeah, that's fabulous. And the again, folks would ask me, you know, what does God think of me? Well, here you go. Uh, what God yeah. thinks of you is you are His own dear child, and He will pursue you and seek you out with a love that is so incredibly profound that it involves sending His Son to suffer, die, and rise again on your behalf. How can you not tell people about that? Uh, when that becomes your reality, how can you not share that? And uh, uh, that's, I think, part of what John's driving at here as well, you know, incorporating his hearers at this point into the we, and then we yeah. being incorporated into that we too by virtue of these words. Uh, one of the easy things to do is say, well, that's the pastor's job, right? You know, he's the preacher. He gets up and he delivers the sermon and he takes care of the, the proclamation of Christ. Uh, well, yes, he is. Pastors are specifically prepared, specially trained, and called by God through congregations to serve as the preachers of the gospel and ministrators yeah. of the sacraments. That's a what a wonderful, wonderful gift. I mean, good grief. I spent my entire adult life pretty much working at that. So uh, I love it. But at the same time, the we really is all of us in the church. And I think that's part of what John is driving at here as he preaches this to his congregation or to multiple congregations through letter, that all of us have this marvelous opportunity to witness to the truth of the gospel and to share this marvelous news of salvation that has been won to us by Christ. Hmm. And man, I, as we're doing that, that's where we show how much we love one another, both in terms of uh, we show how much we love God, of course. We show how much we love one another in terms of those who are already part of the fellowship. But we also then seek to welcome others into the fellowship as well. It's really incredibly dynamic. Uh, you know, people kind of look, you know, they tease Lutherans. There you come in, you sit down in the pew, you listen, and you, and you head home. Uh and we do. I mean, we are receivers of the gifts, and God is the actor. No question about that in every respect. But he also then allows us and enables us to share this good news with others, even if it's as something as simple as come and see, come and see, yeah. come and hear, you know? come and touch, right. come and taste, come and hear this water splash around a little bit, and even some lying on the floor as you make your way yeah. up to communion. That's great stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And then and then we are joined with with like Peter and John in, in Acts chapter four when they say, you know, we, we can't help but speak of what we have seen and what we have heard. We are incorporated into that speaking because we too have seen and heard along with the apostles. And I think this is where, where John is driving in this section. You, you've talked, you use the word that we share in these things, though the word in English that gets uh, translated here a couple of times in these verses is it's fellowship. So, mm -hmm. so John talks about that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. Talk about this fellowship, this sharing. That yeah. John the, it's, up. it's such a great and, and powerful word. Uh, we sometimes we all, we we used to kind of joke. Uh, one of the things we did at my congregation was we had a building program, and uh, we we put an, an addition onto the the church building, and folks called it the fellowship hall. Just you know, well, we're going to build a fellowship hall, and yeah, we are. And and that kind of fellowship that they were thinking about was a good thing. But I said we already have a fellowship hall. You know, it's called the sanctuary, uh, and maybe we can call one the. The Sanctuary Fellowship Hall and the other, the Fun Fellowship Hall, or whatever you want. You know, I mean, that's not such great terminology, but you get my point. Uh, we have, and, and, and I think John's making that point here, this fellowship that we share uh, is something that we are called into by God himself, and it is his creation. He initiates it. He, he creates it, sustains it, nurtures it and makes it a reality. It's that vertical relationship, if you will, that we all enjoy with God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
and it's made real by the Holy Spirit working through word and sacrament, the whole Trinity at work on us as individuals. But he doesn't leave us just as uh, isolated individuals. He welcomes us into a community. And I think that's part of what you see here where when John says, so that you may have fellowship with us, you see kind of the horizontal character of life together in the church that God has been at work and is at work and will be at work in welcoming many, many others into this fellowship that we share. It's a fellowship that embraces our confession, what we believe and speak as being true based on the scriptures. Uh, but it's also a life together as the people of God in Christ, as we grow in him, grow in his word, come to understand the grace of God all the more, confess our sins together and our weaknesses and our failures uh, and are restored through the gracious action of God. And uh, as that word of absolution is spoken over all of us. So, yeah, I mean, you you have this kind of, again, this wonderful dynamism of God at work in us uh, individually, but God at work in us corporately and binding us together all in his son, Jesus. Hmm. Yeah, so the fellowship with the apostles, with each other, and of course, fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. What a what a wonderful thing to share in the, the gifts of God with him and together with his whole church. That is a marvelous thing that John is writing here. And he concludes that in verse 4, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. How does all of this wrap up with joy? Yeah, isn't that great? Have you ever had the day where your joy was complete? I mean, fully complete. I'm, I, I have a lot of joy in my life. I have a wonderful family. I have a marvelous vocation. Uh, there's every day has joy in it. But to think of the absolute fullness of joy, where I don't have problems with my knee. <laughs> I don't have issues with finances or whatever the case might be. Uh, there are things that, that tend to intrude. And, and what John is saying here is there really is a way for our joy to be complete when we, when we look into the face of God, which is Christ's face, and what that then does for us as his people in our lives together. Um, doesn't obviate the church militant aspect we talked about earlier. The struggles are still there. But in Christ, we have everything. The one thing needful, the fullness of God is now ours through him. And that is pretty remarkable, pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and just the way that John says it, he, he says, we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Certainly there is joy in hearing the good news as, as we are, as we do every week. But there's also joy in the speaking of the good news that as we as we share what we have seen and heard, that too brings us joy. As we got about a minute here, Dr. Rass, help us to wrap things up. Talk about the joy, not only of hearing, but also proclaiming this this good news of Christ. Yeah, good. That's an excellent, excellent way to complete this. Uh, what greater joy is there than than helping people see themselves as part of this story that, in fact, Christ, we know it's a fact that Christ died for them, but for them to know, to assent to that, to experience it, to trust in him. And that's really the point here. When you see that happen with a person, there is no greater joy. Uh, and it kind of, uh, well, 19th century folks would have called it disinterested benevolence. Uh, there, it is, you're not tied up in yourself anymore, but you're simply one in Christ. And what a great, great blessing. Dr. Larry Rast is the president of Concordia Theological Seminary in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He has been helping us today to study, to study 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Dr. Rast, thank you so much for being our guest today. My pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity, Pastor. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Faith Lutheran Church in Godfrey, Illinois. If you have any questions about this epistle or sermon of St. John or 2nd or 3rd John, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We're going to be spending a few weeks in these epistles, so looking forward to joining in it with you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week. <laughs>